Hi, this is Ayana Turner, live from I Push Magazine. We are with the incomparable Dr. Umar Johnson. I'm so overwhelmed right now and so honored to meet you, brother. I, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. Now, um, I want to talk to you about the school that you are building for the kids now. Where are you in that process right now? And I did see that you um, want to get St. Paul's College, and which is an HBCU. So tell me a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. Uh, the the uh, program, the agenda to try to acquire the St. Paul's College for the mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy is almost two years old. Mm -hmm. um, I found out that the college was for sale by accident through a friend of mine. Um, a couple of years ago, and so I went to the college, visited the college, toured it, met with the president, met with the auction company, and since that time, we've been trying to raise the two million dollars. Mm -hmm. Originally, we wanted four million because that would give us the school and mm -hmm. the money to rehabilitate and the money to fund the school for the first couple of years. Oh, wow. But once we learned that other people were interested in buying the school, including the federal government, mm -hmm. we decided to reduce the four million dollar goal to two million which would just give us enough money to acquire. But of course, we would still need to do another fundraiser to come up with the additional operating expenses. So St. Mm -hmm. Paul is still my goal. Mm -hmm. It's still available, but it's not the be all and end all. I'm beginning to look at other opportunities. The longer the school sits, the less feasible it's going to become because the more damage through weather and lack of maintenance mm -hmm. is going to accumulate. Mm -hmm. And we already know that it's gonna cost a million dollars to get the school functional. Okay. So if we wait another year, that price might jump to three or four million. So I have to be realistic as much as I wanna continue the legacy of the founder of St. Paul's, Father yes. Russell. I'm looking at other places, including Africa and the Caribbean. That is amazing. Now what would be the criteria for the students to, um, to get into the school? To be black. That's it. I um, love it. Yeah, to be black, all of the children who are selected will be selected by raffle mm -hmm. because we won't have enough seats for everyone. So mm -hmm. anyone who wants to come, it'll be a simple public raffle. Anyone can be there as we pull the names. Some people say that the school should only be for disadvantaged black boys. Well, I would mm -hmm. argue that every black boy is disadvantaged. Right. I cannot discriminate against black boys whose parents are economically comfortable mm -hmm. because they suffer racism the same way we do. That's you know, right. whether you have a three-piece suit on or whether you got your pants sagging white supremacy, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to discriminate against the well-to-do black boys or the uh, poor, low-income black boys because they all need the school. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that. Now, let me ask you something. How does being in, in your field, is, you, because you're a psychologist, how does that help you to help our people? Um, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> First time I think I've asked that. Um, it, it helps me to help our people being a psychologist because I'm able to evaluate and assess how we think, feel, and behave mm -hmm. through a professional lens and mm -hmm. not just a subjective lens. So obviously mm -hmm. I have my own opinions on black folk as Dr. Umar Johnson, but being a psychologist, mm -hmm. I can have a little bit more compassion for the sickness that we have because I can see it through a clinical lens. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, people always talk about why can't black people just come together and work together? What is it mm -hmm. about us? Well, we've been conditioned not to. Mm -hmm. You know, slavery was a process that conditioned you and rewarded you. People forget that. Slavery rewarded us mm -hmm. for working against our own best interests. There were the manumission laws where you could become free mm -hmm. for snitching on a slave rebellion leader. You could become free for exposing another African who was doing something against the wishes of the slave master. Teach. So that mm -hmm. became a culture mm -hmm. to sell each other out. Now, when the culture ended, the behavior continued to this day. We still seek to destroy one another because it's been conditioned. Once it's been conditioned, mm -hmm. you don't have to be rewarded anymore because it's a part of your personality. There was a famous prison experiment that was done at Stanford. A white psychologist, Dr. Lombardo, I believe his name was, mm -hmm. he did an experiment where he took regular people mm -hmm. and put them inside of a prison. This was in the 60s. He wanted to test the effects of power and authority on people's behavior. Mm -hmm. They had to stop the experiment within two days, I think, because guess what? The prison guards, regular people, mm -hmm. who were put in the uniform as a prison guard, actually began to treat the prisoners, who were regular people, mm -hmm. as if they really were criminals. They became so inhumane and so abusive that this, that this study had to been stopped. And one of the results of the study, one of the interpretations was what? People's behavior is significantly impacted 
by the environment created for them. Mm -hmm. You know how they say, well, black people, so what you live in the ghetto, so what you live in America, mm -hmm. you should still be able to achieve. Mm -hmm. But according to that study, and this was empirical research, you cannot separate people's behavior from the box they live in. Wow. Wow. You know, and that flows into the next question. I, I want to say something to you. Mm -hmm. Stop blaming the youth for all of the problems. Yes in our neighborhoods and start looking at the society that they live in. Yes. Now, as a, a single mother like myself, I have three young black men, and I'm Ooh, so proud of them, beautiful. ages 16, 17, and he'll be 21 in October. Right. Now, how can single mothers like myself, how can we raise our young men into being black men? How can we mm. raise them into being black men? Three main messages that I would have for single black mothers. All parents, but especially the mothers, because y'all tend to be the predominant caregiver, mm -hmm. care uh, taker because of the war against black men. Number one, stop letting him off the hook for his lack of discipline. Mm. A lot of our boys are not being prepared for white racist American society mm -hmm. by their mothers who love them so much that they forget to teach them accountability, responsibility, and the laws of consequence. Mm -hmm. America is waiting to swallow our sons up. And the hitch that they're gonna to use to destroy them is their lack of discipline. Mm -hmm. So it is the job of the mother to understand that although you must love and nurture him, you, true love, true love, is to teach him that there are no second chances in this world. So from the time he's two and three years old, when he messes up, this should be a consequence. Teach him that for everything you do, there's a karmic response that follows. Spiritually, politically, economically, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Our mothers, to some extent, are contributing to the effeminization of black boys because they're not providing them with the accountability, the responsibility, the structure, and the discipline. Mm -hmm. Which is to say that a lot of our mothers are raising their sons to be the exact type of man that she herself would never want to marry. Ooh, can your I raise my hands like my grandma did? The opposite of your dream mate. Mm -hmm. You ask the mom, what type of man do you want? Mm -hmm. Now, why are none of those traits in your son? Which mm -hmm. means that you're making him into the worst nightmare for someone else's daughter. And what is often not understood is that boys learn to be men by mom because daddy ain't there. It's not right. fair. It's not fair our sisters have to raise these sons on their own, but I think it's ironic though that when the young sisters complained about not having an adequate spouse, it was a female who nurtured her husband for her to be the failure that he is. So number one, raise them, stop loving them. Number two, number two, teach them to respect divine African female energy. Too many black boys have a profound disrespect for the black mother. It has been codified in hip hop. It's been codified in all every aspect of African culture from the way black women's bodies are sexually objectified mm -hmm. by black women themselves sometimes, you understand? But our boys need to understand that regardless of what that woman is, regardless of what she did or did not do with her life, you must respect the divine female essence within her. There is no disrespect for black women whatsoever. Mothers have to drill that into their son's heads because what I'm finding is most boys learn to disrespect women from their own mother. It's the mother who are teaching these young men, don't trust them hoes, don't trust them skanks. Mm -hmm. You see, when the girl gets pregnant, oh, she trapped my son with that baby. But your son participated in the trapping if it was a trap. He's not absolved of his responsibility. Why are you beating down on that sister instead of beating down on your son as well or holding them both responsible? We all know the stories of how the mothers run to the son's defense even when he is wrong. That's right. So the one, make him be a man. Mm -hmm. Two, make him respect woman. And three, teach him that his destiny is in his own hands. That means he has to be emotionally self-controlled. Mm -hmm. Too many black males are going to jail into the cemetery by not being able to control their emotions because mom exemplified emotional dysfunction herself. You see that? Mm -hmm. So the boy learns to behave like his mother, although he think he's acting like a man. So behind this hyper-masculine persona that is projected by our young men, is a feminine energy that resonates behind that. Mm -hmm. 
You see, that's why the thug can kill so quickly. Okay. Where's your discipline at? You murdered him on emotion. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. You did the dope on emotion. Half of what our young men are doing, they're doing it on emotion, which is often aligned with the feminine principle. We need the emotion. We need the feminine principle. We got both, but he's a man, so his masculinity should dominate. Teach him that there's a time and a place. Teach him that his fate is in his own hands. You cannot blame his father being dead or in jail That's or incarcerated. Right. You cannot blame your mother for being on welfare or for being poor. You have the same 24 hours a day as everyone else. You have the mm -hmm. same two feet, two hands as everyone else. You have the same brain as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the raw materials necessary to make a success of yourself, there's no excuses for why you cannot be one. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm -mm. I, I feel like my grandmother right now when she said I can't speak I just wave my hands because that that is so true what you're saying and see here in Birmingham there is a lot of violence and it's a lot of our young black men a lot of the robberies that have been going on lately young black men a lot of the murders young black men every time you turn on the television every week it's a killing here yes and it's our young black men what can we do to stop that because the the solution is not always jail it's something That's not behind a solution it. at all so what what do we do to stop this violence the mother of all violence mm -hmm. is miseducation mm -hmm. the father of all violence is economic castration if you don't do anything about the miseducation and you don't do anything about the economic castration you'll never reverse the violence because the violence is a nurtured by desperation anger pain and depression you see so they're not killing just to kill he might have shot him for disrespecting him but what was the psychological underpinning why was he so angry that being disrespected would lead him to take another man's life because he can't get a job to pay his child support. He's walking around with that pain. Mm -hmm. You see, he's upset because his mother is in a hospital and she don't have any medical coverage and he's the sole provider for the family and he don't know how to make ends meet and he's thinking he may have to break the law just to take care of his mother's medical bills. That was the precipitating agent in the violent clash. Mm -hmm. When you read about it in the newspaper or hear about it in the courtroom, they don't tie it to the personal economic struggles of the black male. They didn't tie it to the fact that he was 21 years old and couldn't even read or write his own name. Mm -hmm. Economics and education are at the basis. Let's go back. 60 years ago in American history, it was the Irish, the Italians, and the Jews who sold the dope. They ran the gangs. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they had no education and they had no economic opportunity, so they made their own. Robbing people, rackets, running numbers. They broke the law to feed. Same thing black men doing today. Why don't the Irish, Italian, and Jews kill each other in the streets like they used to? Because the United States government gave them an economic stimulus package mm -hmm. in the form of the fire department, police department, wow. and mm -hmm. the civil service jobs. Mm -hmm. Obama ain't giving us no economic stimulus package. Mm -hmm. All black men are doing is what the poor white males used to do. It's the same thing. When men cannot be men, my job is to protect and provide. Mm -hmm. Protect, I got that. But provide, I need an opportunity. Mm -hmm. If you don't give me an opportunity, which means I'm not fulfilling my definition of a man, that I become insecure. And I look for any other way to manifest my manhood that is available to me. And the only way, the only means of manifesting manhood for black men in America, killing each other and having children. Those are the two things you can do that don't require opportunity from the white man, to take a life or to mm -hmm. make one. That is so true. Now, when I, when, I first, when I first heard you speak with such authority, and I was, I was so overwhelmed and I, I was listening to you with an urgency and I couldn't wait to get here and just to hear you. Now, what do you want people to take away from here tonight after you speak? Um, I always, whenever I give a presentation, I always try to make it a buffet mm -hmm. because I don't know who's in the audience and I don't know he, who needs what. Mm -hmm. Somebody might need a morsel of relationship advice. Mm -hmm. Somebody else might need a morsel of a pick myself up and uh, try to get back in my life on the right path. They, they, they defeat it and they just need a pickup message. Mm -hmm. Somebody else needs something to help their child, prevent them from going into special ed. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody else needs to improve their relationship with their child. Somebody else is dealing with racism. Uh, somebody else is dealing with economics. I try to hit on a couple different things in every speech because I don't know who needs what, mm -hmm. hoping that by the end everybody got something uh, that was worth spending their time with me for. Yes, sir. 
And thank you so much for the interview. I'm telling uh, you, I'm, I'm just, mine. I'm so honored to meet you. This is such a pleasure. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say? Uh, well, I want to let everybody know that we got the Black Boy and Girl College Tour coming up this summer, June 30th to July 14th. 14 days and 14 nights. We're going to be taking the young men and women to the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm was murdered. They're going to go to the world famous Apollo Theater. They're going to go to the Ferncliff Cemetery where Malcolm, Paul Robeson, Aaliyah James Baldwin, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, Malcolm Chabaz, and Yusuf Ben Yakin in the Bury. We're going to go to Cheney and Lincoln, our two oldest HBCUs, Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore. We're going to go to the Harriet Tubman Home and grave, the Frederick Douglass grave, the Fred Douglass house. We're gonna to go to Morgan State, Coppin State, Bowie State, Dell State. I'm gonna take them on the Harriet Tubman Underground Tour in Maryland. Wow. They're also gonna to go to the Nat Turner Tour, where Nat Turner led the bloodiest slave revolt in American history. They're gonna relive that. They're gonna to go to the movies, Dorney Park, Great Adventures. It's a beautiful two weeks, uh, two weeks, uh, 14 days, 14 nights. If you have a boy or girl between the age of 11 and 17, between the age of 11 and 17, you can register them right now at princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. And we spell Africa with a K, princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. Also want your parents to know every Tuesday morning, mm -hmm. I host a free black parent teleconference. If you ever have a question about your child, mm -hmm. education and mental health, you can call me for free, no money, and ask any questions, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. Tuesday morning. If you need that information, it's on my website, drumarjohnson.com. Also, our group tour to Africa. We're going to Senegal and South Africa this year, July 24th to August the 9th. You will go to the Gory Island Slave Dungeon, the Nelson and Winnie Mandela home that they lived in during their fight with apartheid, Shaka Zulu's grave site and museum, Soweto, the apartheid museum, the Hector Peterson Museum. If you're interested, you can get in contact with me at drumarjohnson.com. And last thing, I want to invite everyone to Baltimore. We're going to be in Baltimore May 27th to the 29th for the National Independent Black Parent Association Conference. We're organizing black parents to go back into their cities and fight against academic racism. There will be a special ed committee, school discipline, school finance, social support, school policy, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. This is the first national organization designed specifically to organize parents to protect our children, boys and girls, against academic racism. If you're interested, you can register again at princeofpanafricanism.eventbrite.com. And please make your donations to the Fred Douglas Marcus Garvey Academy. And you can do that two ways. GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. Again, GoFundMe.com slash D-R-U-M-A-R. Or you can mail it in, payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia, 19132. And if you want to work at the school, I know we're about two years away, but if you want to work at the school, send me your resume, please, to fdmgresumes at gmail.com. fdmgresumes at gmail.com. And if you need more information on the college tour, Dr. Umar College Tour at gmail.com. All right, you heard it. The amazing Dr. Umar Johnson, and thank you all for rocking with iPush Magazine.